Dr. Janakiran, can you hear us? Uh, good morning here uh, in Brazil. Good evening in India. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to uh, have many friends from many countries and more two friends from uh, Sao Paulo University to comment Professor Master Janakiran. And uh, now I, I will, Dr. Uh, Oswaldo Laércio and Dr. Ronaldo, uh, I asked uh, Jose Andrade to, to uh, make the, the talk uh, with uh, them, with Dr. Ronaldo and uh, Dr. Oswaldo Laércio. And uh, let's begin. Dr. Jaraquira, right. are you here? Can you hear us, doctor? Yes, very well. Can you hear me, please? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We are. We are really happy to 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 see yeah. you. Yeah, this is a very special day for us because yeah. we are hearing again from you. Fifteen days ago, we had a wonderful presentation on JNA surgery. Everybody here was really impressed, uh, and it's an honor to receive you again. We have also two masters from Brazil in the field, which is Professor Osvaldo Laesio who was uh, uh, a leading leader for all of us, uh, who taught many, many techniques for us. Uh, he's a professor from the Universidade Federal de São Paulo, Federal São Paulo University, and uh, also a member of the Leon Foundation. Uh, we have also uh, Dr. Ronaldo Toledo, who is weekly doing uh, school-based surgery, uh, state-of-the-art school-based surgery, at a cancer center here in, in, in Sao Paulo. It's, a, it's an honor to, to have the, these two to, to make comments and participate in the discussion. And uh, I would uh, say, say hello and, and, and greet everybody who's watching. Uh, thank you for the presence of all. Uh, Dr. Ronaldo, Dr. Osvaldo Laes, are, are you hearing us also? Yes, I'm hearing very well. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations. Dr. Ahad Kiradan, and I, it will be a pleasure to listen to your talk. Thanks. Okay. Can I start? Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, you know, um, join hands and, uh, you know, share our knowledge rather than, you know, um, teach. This is just a sharing of knowledge between India and Brazil. Uh, I really thank Dr. Nilvano. Uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity, uh, Dr. Jose uh, Andrade, uh, Professor Ronaldo Toledo, uh, Professor Osvaldo Cruz, and uh, many, many friends from Brazil. Uh, as you know, I was in Brazil around, uh, I think, a few um, months back and uh, made friends with a lot of uh, people in rhinology. And uh, now back, we are uh, in one home, just one home, sitting at home and uh, Brazil and India are so nearby and we're able to communicate just through the, uh, uh, you know, the webinars. Um, in one way, I thank the corona, but also uh, I feel sad for all of our brothers who actually are being affected by this dreaded disease. And uh, my sincere heart goes out to all, all of our friends throughout the world who have been affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, with this uh, introduction, I first of all uh, would like to tell uh, some brief introduction about myself as a skull base surgeon. So, when I started doing my um, uh, uh, ENT and then I did my skull base, uh, actually I properly got trained in otology. So, I was initially an otologist. So, I traveled to Stuttgart uh, and also to Professor Helms, to House Institute, and then to uh, Mario Sana and uh, several other people like that. And then I visited the centers and I got properly trained in otology. My basis, basics was in otology. But then I realized that uh, there are many, many otologists in the world doing wonderful job. So uh, I, it's not very good for me to you know, project myself as an otologist. And then in 2005, I uh, changed myself into a rhinologist. So then I became a full-time rhinologist but as you know, in India, uh, we also do all the cases, like we do uh, lateral skull base, we do anterior skull base, uh, we do, I also do the uh, intracranial work and things like that. So uh, it's, it's a mixture. So our center is a tertiary care center. 
It's a private hospital. It's not an university, but it's a private hospital which uh, caters to uh, uh, um, a reference from all over the globe. Uh, and uh, we have patients from all over Asia coming in and getting operated at our center. So with this uh, introduction, small introduction, I really thank my brothers, my brothers and sisters from Brazil uh, for this opportunity. And uh, without much ado, we will go into the uh, presentation. To what today's topic is a very interesting topic, a very uh, topic which is very close to my heart. And uh, that is actually uh, going to be a screen share here. And let's uh, straight away go on to the topic without much ado. So what you're going to see today is uh, uh, temporal jugular paragangliomas. So that's going to be the topic of uh, today. And uh, we come from India to Brazil, and both of us uh, are like brothers and sisters. My name is uh, Narayanan Janakiram. I'm a skull base surgeon. I do both uh, anterior and lateral skull base. Also, a little bit of intracranial work as well, like craniopharyngiomas. These are all areas of interest to me. And uh, also acoustic neuromas and, uh, of course, uh, uh, microvascular decompressions for trisomal nerve, uh, petroclival uh, meningiomas, and uh, things like that. So um, now let us go on to this topic. Uh, so previously, this was um, you know addressed as glomus uh, tumors or glomus jugulate. So that's what that's how it was called. There are various names uh, attributed to it, but now we are not supposed to uh, call it as the glomus. We are supposed to call it as a tuberal jugular paraganglioma. So you have both the TJP, that's the uh, tuberal jugular paraganglioma, and the cervical carotid paragangliomas. So I'm going to show you a few cases of the temporal jugular paraganglioma and also a case of a cervical carotid paraganglioma. So we're going to see carotid body tumor as well as uh, temporal jugular paragangliomas. Just a little bit of overview of the cases. So temporal jugular paragangliomas, they arise from the adventitia of the uh, jugular bulb and along the course of the Jacobson's nerve, or the Arnold's nerve. So I hope I'm audible to you all. Am I audible, Dr. Yes, uh, yes we can hear yeah. perfectly. Yeah, okay. the, the audio is great. Okay, now we have the glomus, uh, sorry, the tympanicum, which arises uh, in the promontory. Uh, it arises in the promontory and confined to the middle ear without erosion of the jugular bulb. So we have uh, some tumors which are arising from the promontory confined to the middle ear without erosion of the uh, uh, jugular bulb. Now, jugular paragangliomas arise within the jugular bulb. So you have the tympanic where it doesn't erode onto the jugular bulb and the jugular paragangliomas which arise within the jugular bulb, inside the jugular bulb. Okay, now paragangliomas, the head and neck, uh, you can see that 3% of it constitutes 3% of all paragangliomas. 60% are carotid body tumors. So 60% of the tumors or paragangliomas of the head and neck are carotid body tumors. That's why I'm going to touch upon carotid body tumor as well as I'm going to... So in our center, we do both carotid body tumor as well as we do paragangliomas. Uh, uh, so I'm going to touch upon both. Uh, we also have the vagal paragangliomas and of course uh, that constitutes 5%. So the distribution is like this, 60% uh, 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 carotid body tumors, 40% are uh, TJPs, and uh, the vagal constitutes around uh, uh, 5%. Now, carotid body tumors and vagal paragangliomas are called cervicocarotid paragangliomas. So they are called cervicocarotid paragangliomas. They're here, they're here. And so they're called cervicocarotid, tympano jugular, cervicocarotid. Very simple classification. So it arises between the fourth and sixth decade of life, and it has got a female preponderance. So usually they are females. Most of my cases are uh, usually females. And of course it can arise in males, but uh, more common in uh, females. So the TJP, it arises from the adventitia of the anterolateral region of the jugular bulb. And of course, I told you the cochlear promontory and from the inferior tympanic canaliculus. Now histology, as you all know, it's a classic Zellbollen configuration uh, chief cells surrounded by fibrovascular stroma and, of course, sustentacular cells. This is uh, just the histology of the uh, temporal jugular palagangliomas. It's a benign, slow-growing tumor, and it presents with hearing loss and pulsatile tinnitus. It has pulsatile tinnitus and hearing loss. So some patients can 
present also with bleeding from the ear. We have seen oral polyp, a presentation like an oral polyp. But sometimes the patient can just say, I just have hearing loss and you have a pulsatile tinnitus. This can also be a presentation. So the medial wall of the jugular bulb uh, is actually the barrier uh, between the tumor. Uh, is that I'm going to discuss about how we're going to preserve the medial wall of the jugular bulb when we dissect. And that's going to be the barrier between the tumor and the nerves. Of course, this, these can actually metastasize. Two to five percent can metastasize into the regional lymph nodes. Now, what are the two signs which we see in the uh, TJP? Uh, one is called the brown sign, blanching of the middle ear component on signalization. That's a brown sign. And the rising sun appearance, if the tumor has invaded the tympanic bone, you have the rising sun appearance. So you have two different uh, uh, signs which you have to uh, know about the Phelps sign also. We'll be talking about that. Now, suppose the patient comes to us, unilateral hearing loss, pulsatile tinnitus, maybe a bleeding polyp, uh, which you suspect uh, a temporal jugular paraganglioma, then the first thing I would like to do is a CT with contrast. So I will do, do a CCT with contrast. I will thoroughly read the axial and the coronal. And I always say, I always say this for all our young colleagues, go to the console of the radiologist and read the uh, scans. Do not read it like a film. That's not a great idea. You have to go to the console because they will change so many window settings. I will show you some of how we study the CD scans and the MRI scans uh, in the radiology console. Of course, I will take an MRI, a T1 and a T2, and a T1 with contrast, an MRA and an MRV. So all these have to be done when you are suspecting a, a tumor of a temporal jugular paraganglioma. Of course, yeah, we divide it into a secretory and a non-secretory tumor. Secretory tumor, then you have... Uh, uh, hello? Hello. Yeah, we are here. Well. Hello. Maybe someone turn on, turn it on, but you, you can go on, sir. Okay. So always uh, uh, in CT we have what is called the moth-eaten appearance. It's called the moth-eaten appearance, uh, very clearly seen in the CT scan. And what you will see in a T2 weighted MRI is what is called the salt and pepper appearance. It's called the salt and pepper appearance. It's just an overview. I'm going to show you cases. More importantly, I want to show you cases rather than to give you theory. All this is given in any standard textbook. Uh, of course, the staging systems, you know, I'm going to now go on to uh, videos and we will see a lot, lot, lot of videos of uh, how we do uh, um, the uh, paraganglioms, the temporal jugular paraganglioma. So we have done around 180 cases of uh, uh, temporal jugular paraganglioma. So we are going to show you uh, how it presents to you of course this is how it presents can you see the uh, video please you can see here the rising sun appearance here you can see that uh, it's along the uh, uh, floor and this has eroded the tympanic bone that's why you're seeing it like that did you see that please can you see that yes we saw uh, yeah the now you can see under the presentation i have a, a, a various kinds of presentation this is one of the uh, presentations you see in the outpatient department you see something like this uh, the whole, uh, uh, you know, external canal completely pulsating. The whole external canal completely pulsating. Or you can have a polyp which is just pulsating. The most important point for the juniors is that don't take a biopsy. Some people go and just pluck it and it will bleed very badly. It's like the JNA. Really want to tell you again and again and again. This has been repeated. I'm sorry I didn't come for the pituitary lecture because my current was not there uh, in this uh, so last week we could have done the pituitary lecture. I'm sorry I couldn't do that. Oh, okay, no, so, no, no, no. yeah, the thing is that, see, the most important thing which you should write and get an information from the radiologist is what phase in which it has been given to you. This is something... We don't have your, your screen here. You, you stopped the screen. Your no, no. Screen is... Can you see my face now? Um, yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah, you have. Yeah, not, yeah, okay, great. Okay, not yeah, the screen. Okay. You're seeing my face, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, right. I'm not sharing right now. I'm just explaining. Whenever you get a CD scan, get it in, you have to write which phase you want it in. You want the venous phase, you want the arterial phase, or you want a normal soft or a bone window. So, this is a very important thing, which is generally not uh, taught or, you know, taught during our uh, you know, postgraduate period or during conferences, we don't exactly talk about which phase 
in which you want the CD scan. So here I'm telling you that whenever I do a skull base, I always ask for an arterial face, a venous face, a brain uh, a window, brain window, it's called a brain window. And also we get also sometimes the soft tissue window. And then of course we go to the radiologist and also we, uh, we discuss about it. Now I will go in for the screen share now. Now I'm going to show you some uh, videos of how we do glomus, uh, sorry, the uh, temporal jugular paragangliomas. Now let us start. Royal Pearl Hospital is a tertiary care center for anterior and lateral skull base. We are Dr. Janikram, Dr. Shripi Bhadeshwarma, Dr. Abhilasha from India. And you're going to see a very interesting teaching video on temporal jugular paragangioma, stage class B. I too, and we are from Royal Pearl Hospital, India. Only set up at Royal Pearl Hospital is as follows. You can see that we use the NC4 microscope and we also use the nerve monitor. So the most important thing is that you should have a good microscope that is uh, use either a Pentro or uh, maybe an NC4 or a very high-end uh, uh, um, Zeiss microscope and always, always have a nerve monitor. When you operate on a, any skull base, uh, whether it's anterior or lateral, you should have uh, all the nerve monitors with you, both the uh, 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 sensory as well as the motor, the facial nerve monitor, as well as the uh, SSCP monitor. So and here we are. Uh, this is the setup for our lateral skull base. Now coming to the classification, we're now going to talk about more. So I'm now going to put up the chart. You know, this is uh, by uh, um, the uh, SANAS classification, modified fish classification. You know the tumor A, type A, type B, and type C. Now the type C tumor is what we're going to talk to today. And we're going to talk about the C1, C2, C3, C4. Of course, the A and B are very small tumors. Anybody can operate on A, a and B. That's not a big issue. But we're going to talk about tumors which are involving the carotid. So if it involves the carotid, uh, the vertical portion of the uh, carotid, of the petrous carotid, it's C2. If it's uh, uh, involving the horizontal portion of the carotid, it's C3. If it's uh, going till the uh, level of the foramen lazerum, it's C4. If it is going intracranially extradural, it is DE. So it is uh, one centimeter or two centimeter, you have to specify that. And if it is going to be intracranial intradural, that is BI, one to two, two, two centimeters. And of course, DI3, DI3, it is more than three centimeters. So we have operated on almost all these tumors. Now we have also operated on cases which are involving the uh, uh, vertebral artery. Uh, so we have the uh, tumors involving extradural vertebral artery. Of course, I have not, uh, I have had a cases, a case, I had cases of uh, intradural vertebral artery but uh, we left behind a little bit tumor on the intradural vertebral artery. Apart from that, we have done all varieties of uh, glomus, uh, I mean, the temporal jugular paragangioma. You're going to see some beautiful cases of uh, C1, C2, C3, C4, of course, of uh, D, E, D, I, all that we will show you now. Okay, now let us go on to the, uh, you know, uh, the, the case proper. So what is the surgery which we do? Uh, oh, we do that the arterial supply. So we do the uh, infratemporal fossa type A, type A for uh, the surgery for these tumors. Now I'm just going to show you that that was a tumor. We embolize the tumor and we will start with the incision. Now let us start with the incision. And this is the incision we take the last time. The second step. So the incision extends. You see here from the level of the parietal, then you go to the temporal and then to the cervical. So it's like a question mark, a question mark incision we call, and it's an a incision which is a, made a post orally, and that's the first step. Or uh, we drape it with a craniotomy set, uh, and uh, we start the surgery after uh, uh, connecting the patient to uh, the right. monitors. The second step would be a little anterior skin muscle flap there. You can see that till the level of the. The next would be elevation of the periodon, uh, one centimeter. You can see that. That is actually used for the blind sac closure. So there are two incisions which we make. The one is the first incision like that, and then we elevate the flap. And then we make a small incision here. You can see this incision. 
Can you all appreciate it, Dr. Jose? Can you see this incision? Yes, we made we are here. Perfectly that, well. is, that is a periosteal incision, and that is the, you know uh, shot from an external camera, so it's a little blurred, but you will see the yeah, video very well. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> that incision is done for the blind sac closure. Please understand that some surgeons prefer to do. So I am going to tell you that. There are various ways and various tricks in the surgery. Some people love to do the blind sac closure as the first step. But sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't do it, I change my steps. But basically, you can do the blind sac closure first as the first step. That's, that's also a good way to start. Now you can see here. And that is it. So you can see that flap will go along with the sternoclamastoid muscle. And you can see it. Now this is raised inferiorly now. A case which was done on the right here, but we have chosen two cases. So now we will see the middle ear finding in case two. So you can see that this is actually the finding. The patient presented with history of uh, heart of hearing and also tinnitus uh, bleeding from the ear and the sternocromastoid from its tip. And this is how we dissect it. Okay, so the first would be, see, basically I have done both. Uh, so I want to tell you that we can either start with the neck and then go to the ear or sometimes I start with the ear, go to the neck. It depends upon, uh, suppose my, uh, my fellows are doing, then he starts, I ask them to start with the, uh, uh, the mastoid part and then go in for the neck part. But when I start, I start with the neck part. But basically you can form your own rules about what to start first. But uh, what, when I start, I start the neck part. The first step is to identify, uh, the, so what you do is you uh, transect the sternocleum mastoid and reflect it backwards and the first structure you have to identify is the spinal accessory nerve. So point number one, identification of the accessory nerve. Just like that one, there's from the accessory nerve, you can see that the first structure we trace down the neck. We've done more than now 75 cases of uh, other kind of mass. You can now see that this is the 12, the internal jugular vein, and the leg. Now you can see that we are now trying to... So that's the 12th nerve, and that's the ANSA hypoglossi. You can see the ANSA hypoglossi here very clearly. Delineate the ANSA hypoglossi. You can see the ANSA hypoglossi there very clearly which actually descendants hypoglossi and the descendants cervicalis on the ansa cervicalis. This is now the 11, the 12, very beautifully seen there in your picture, 12. So that's the internal and the external carotid artery. See how beautiful the neck dissection is for you. All the structures, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, nerve, and its branches in the carotid. So you have to, so the following structures have to be identified in the neck, it's slightly edited. So you can see that the first structure which you identify is the 11th cranial nerve. And then what you do is you identify the 12th cranial nerve, that's the 12th cranial nerve which loops over the, uh, um, the uh, carotid artery. Of course you identify the internal jugular vein. So here you can take two routes. Uh, people generally, you know, close the sigmoid sinus and then they ligate the internal jugular vein. But I've done both ways. I didn't find much difference. So I actually ligate the internal jugular vein and cut it. And then I identify the 10th nerve. And then identify the common carotid artery. Then the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. That's the external carotid artery. This is the internal carotid artery. And then what I do is I tie the internal carotid artery. I, I ligate the extra, sorry. I ligate the external carotid artery. And I loop the internal carotid artery. And I know with a rubber band, you have the color code that this is the internal carotid artery. And after that, this is the neck part. So what I've done is I've identified the 11, I've identified the 10, I've identified the 12, I've identified the internal jugular vein, the external carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, and of course, uh, the next step would be to identify the facial nerve. External carotid artery nerve and scratches in the carotid. So you identify the facial nerve, you can see here, you can, you, you're seeing the uh, 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 two branches of the facial nerve, the common trunk, and you have to dissect the two branches right distally so that you can actually transpose this facial nerve anteriorly. You see how beautiful the facial nerve is seen? 
Can you all appreciate the facial nerve, the two trunks of the facial nerve? Yes. Yeah. You so the, the dichromatic or temporal and the uh, uh, yeah the cervical uh, you can and see that very clearly. Cervical or temporal and the cervical fish very beautifully see the trunk, the main trunk, and the two divisions: dichromatic or temporal, cervical facial branch. What a brilliant view of the facial nerve seen there. Merging, we see it, 12, 9, 10, 11, IGB, all that. MRI is done, modified radical mastoidectomy is done. You can see that it has already been done. Simply dissected free from its canal. We will be dissecting the facial nerve now and using a cutting board, we transect or so what we do is we do a modified radical mastoidectomy. I've, I've edited it because everybody knows how to, if you have to do a glomus, you should know how to do a modified radical mastoidectomy. I cannot show MRM here. So that you do an MRM that is modified radical mastoidectomy. And then what you do is you have to uh, uh, reset the mastoid tip, completely remove the mastoid tip and then remove the styloid process. You remove the styloid process. So these are the steps. The neck, you identify the 11, you identify the 12, you identify the internal circular vein, the 10, the, uh, the common carotid, the external carotid, the internal carotid, then facial nerve, then do an MRM, then after the MRM, you resect the mastoid tip, and then, of course, after the mastoid tip, you resect the styloid process. So till that, I have done now. Size the mastoid tip. So that's the next phase. Now you can see that the facial nerve is thin. We try to elevate that bone. And we are now trying to decompress the facial nerve. So what do we do? We have to do an anterior transfacial nerve anteriorly half of tissue because we'll have to hold the uh, uh, anterior. So what you do is you anteriorly transpose the facial nerve. That's very important. You have to transpose it. When you transpose it, have a cuff of tissue along the level of the uh, uh, you know stylomastoid foramen. Have a little bit of tissue. And you have to nicely dissect the distal part, and then you can actually create a groove here, and you can put some fibrin glue uh, right there, and the facial nerve completely goes out of your way. And once you do that, then you can dissect the tumor. So I just wanted to show you this part of the dissection so that I can. Actually, yeah. And uh, once we check, would be resection of the uh, cellophanages. It's called the relevance. Okay. And all the muscles are divided, excised, steroid process. What we then do is occlusion of the, uh, we use the insert cell there. So we then occlude the sigmoid sinus. So what we have done, we have anteriorly transposed the facial nerve, resected the styloid process, and what we do is we occlude the sigmoid sinus. How do we occlude it? You can do it intraluminally, extraluminally, but what I usually do is I create a pocket, a nice pocket just where the sigmoid transits on to the, uh, uh, the jugular bulb, I, I occlude it right there. So I extra luminally compress it with a lot of surgery cell and I completely occlude. So these are the initial steps which you have to do. And most importantly, most importantly, you have to completely resect the temporal, uh, tympanic part of the uh, temporal bone. So you have, to, you have to completely drill it out. So the tympanic part should be drilled out. So I'm going to show you. So this is actually an initial part of the video. And we will see now a, a, a very clear case of how we are going to operate on a, a glomus. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Mario Sana, uh, uh, whom I got trained with. Let us now go on to see this uh, case, a CD and an MRI. And this is the uh, uh, um, MRI of the patient. You can see that very clearly. You can see the tumor. And you can see the tube, huge tumor here. And it's actually going intracranially as well. You're having an intracranial. And this patient had a very, a very huge intracranial component. So if you have a very huge intracranial component and engulfing the carotid, what we usually do is we stage the tumor. So it's very important uh, that when you operate on a tumor which is actually having both an extracranial and an intracranial, see this component here. See here, there's a huge intracranial component. So if you have an intracranial component that is more than two centimeters, don't try to resect the tumor in one stage. Why you don't do that? Because you will have a CSF leak. You will have a massive, because you don't have the tympanic bone. So you'll have a massive CSF leak. So please do not try to resect it at a single stage. You have to do a two stage 
procedure for removal of the tumor. So what we will do is we will resect it till the level of the uh, extracranial component and leave behind the intracranial component and we will either come through the same route or the retrosigmoid approach and we will remove the uh, uh, intracranial component. I am going to show you that now this tumor has got a massive intracranial component and an extracranial component to see how we operate. Now let's start. So embolization was done and this is the pre-embolization pictures. You can see that this is actually the tumor blush, very vascular tumor. And this is the post embolization. You can see that uh, the artery acid pharyngeal has been completely occluded. And there is no tumor blush at all. Discussion in the stage c 3 d i 2 So, approach in front of and force are type A and it should be staged. This is the ear findings. You can see the middle ear component. Patient had severe pulsatile tinnitus, classical rising sun appearance. And this is an endoscopic picture now. So we decided to do the ear component and then stage the intracranial component after three to six months. This is the exposure, making a small flap for the blind sac closure, then making the next incision, starting with drilling. You can see that we are now having a brilliant exposure there. So we can do the neck part of it first, or we can do the ear part of it. That's the middle fossa dura. So what we do when we do the ear part is that we expose the middle fossa dura and also right till the sigmoid sinus. You can see that uh, this is almost like a skull based exposure. If you have an acoustic, you will, uh, you know, remove this bone completely two centimeters above and two centimeters behind the sigmoid. Go for a pre sigmoid or a post sigmoid dura exposure. So they say, uh, but you don't have to do that. The, to that extent in a glomus uh, or in a temporojugular paragangioma, you see that that's a middle fossa. You can see that you are now getting a very nice exposure there. That is the dura being cauterized. We included the sigmoid sinus. That's the ear canal. Doing an MRM. Then tracing the facial nerve. You can see that the facial nerve is being traced with a diamond drill. You have to do a facial nerve decompression. So the main aspect was the patient had a complete engulfment of the carotid artery, more than 270 degrees. But the patient did not give a consent for you know, high risk. That's so what you have to do is to do a retrofacial dissection. You see that that's a retrofacial dissection which has been done. So you then completely make that facial nerve naked. You see that how we do that. It's very important. And now we I elevate the facial nerve from its canal. That was something which was uh, very worrying us. And also he was not affording a BOT. So it was a little stressful on our part to take this case. So having decompressed the facial now, we went with the neck. And now the first structure we always identify, we have seen all our plumus, the spinal axillary now. Of course, all these nerves are paralyzed preoperatively. That's in terms of we ligated the second structure. We have now a very huge series of lomas. Now that's a carotid artery. And you can see the hypoglossal just about. That's the internal carotid artery being taped. So we tape all the vital structures in the neck. The neck part was almost lidless. And that's the facial nerve in the carotid. You can see that this is the two branches of the facial nerve. 
with a cuff of tissue, we are trying to anteriorly transpose this patient. Once we did that, you can see the tumor very clearly in the tubular foram. So we will take a bite there and then anchor the tissue now. Now you can see that that is the neck component. We now put the neck component now. Then we will. You can see that it's right inside the interventricular vein. We are delivering it out. And after doing that, we're going anteriorly, that's the internal carotid artery. So this video, we will concentrate more on the dissection of the internal carotid artery. We can see that we are dissecting the tumor from the internal carotid artery. You can see the internal carotid. So you can see that it's going medial with the internal carotid artery now. That's the internal carotid artery here. So we that's have internal to carotid transpose artery. this, and this dissection has been named by Professor Marisana as uh, subperiosteal, subadventitial. So this is called subadventitial dissection of the internal carotid artery. So what we do is we go along the uh, adventitia, we open it up, and then actually we uh, shave that tumor off. But so there are some cases which will actually completely engulf the carotid and completely, you know, narrow the carotid. And for those cases, what we do is we do a, bina, a balloon occlusion test. And what we do is we uh, coil the carotid. So we coil the carotid and we resect the carotid. We resect the carotid along with the tumor. So that is what we do. But this case, you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to dissect the tumor from the carotid. carotid artery, you can see that this tumor is completely engulfing the carotid artery. So the ideal situation would be to actually do a BOT and coil the carotid. But the patient did not afford that. You can see the tumor how completely it is encased the carotid artery. The carotid artery is right in the center. It's going lateral then posterior, then medial, except a little part of the anterior. So how you can see the dissection there between and creating a cleavage. Once we've done that, you can see that the dissection should be extremely delicate. And we use uh, the bipolar so that it is almost bloodless. So the dissection of the tumor becomes very easy when you actually embolize the tumor. So if you don't embolize, it's full of blood. It's bloody, very bloody. It's not like the JNA, where you actually ligate the vessel and complete vascularity goes off. But here, it's not like that. Even if you ligate the vessel, it keeps bleeding. So it's better to embolize the tumor. So embolization is the first step in any glomus or any tympanogicular paraganglioma we do, if it is going to be more than a stage C tumor. So that is very important. You can see that now it is almost an unedited version of the carotid dissection. So, at one stage, we'll go sub periosteal, sub adventitial. You'll see that now. Very gently trying to take that medial component. So that's medial to the carotid. That's medial to the vertical portion of the internal carotid artery. I'm dissecting it medial. And it's going superior and actually it's going towards the middle. You see how we are going to separate that carotid from the tumor. See how it was added to the carotid. Completely added to the Now you see, uh, what I've done now is to separate the tumor from the carotid artery. And you can see that's a medial component going underneath the carotid artery. Now we prefer doing an anterior transposition of the carotid artery. So we'll do that shortly. You can see that's a carotid being dissected. Um, now here is the adventitial layer. Can you all appreciate the adventitial layer here? 
My dear friends, can you see that? Yes. And yeah, I'm going up it. until the shoulder. Yeah. yeah. And I'm dissecting the tumor away from the carotid artery. Now, what I will do is to transpose this carotid superiorly and anteriorly. You see how we do that? Yes. Now you can see the tumor. So blunt dissection there. That is the vertical and then the horizontal uterus. So now Let's see the tumor dissection is very gentle. So we always embolize uh, uh, glomus tumors in our center. In fact, this is the third case for this month, 14 days. See that that is tumor dissection being done. So when you use the bipolar, the bipolar near the carotid or even over the glomus, my setting of the bipolar is around 20, 20 to 30. So don't keep a very high setting because you don't want to transfer the heat towards any vessel or the nerve. So the most, of course, in this case, you had all the lower cranial nerves already palsy. Already there was a 9, 10, 11 uh, palsy. But if you don't have a palsy of the lower cranial nerves, always try to preserve the medial wall of the jugular foramen. That's very important because that is the protective layer to the lower cranial nerve. So this patient already had a palsy of the 1911. So always better to use bipolar. And then it comes right over the carotid, which is use cold steel instruments. And debulk that tumor. So that's the debulking. Almost an unedited version of we did that. Over the carotid, you can see the component in. So, so we the identified the component going intracranially very early, and uh, that was actually spared because we didn't want to have a massive CSF leak without a tympanic bone, so that we will prevent a massive CSF leak. So we are now going to stay that tumor for three months, but this component I want to remove completely. Now you can see that's the carotid artery component. That is the carotid, the one which is right over the carotid artery. So it was going immediately there. So as we all know, the carotid actually turns here, uh, uh, just below the eustachian tube. It just turns and becomes the horizontal carotid. And you will see that we are chasing the tumor towards the genome of the carotid. Now we decided to do the anterior transposition. See how the carotid is right in the center of the tumor. Well, that's the anterior transposition of the carotid artery going on 360 degrees, taking a loop, then transposing the carotid. Now we have a lot of space to operate, going for the medial component. And the carotid to protect her off the tumor. So we loop the carotid like this, we loop it and then move the carotid upwards. Okay, you can ask me, suppose the carotid is completely, the, the tumor is adherent to the carotid, what do we do? So if it is adherent, then what you have to do is you have to ideally do a balloon occlusion test and then you, if he passes the uh, test, you, uh, you put in coils here. You put in coils and you can resect this carotid. You can completely resect this carotid and remove the carotid along with the tumor. Of course, there are centers where they put in stents. They put in stents in the carotid. Uh, we have done one such case where we put in stent inside the carotid and we can shave the tumor of the carotid. So that's also possible.
This size we close on all of us. Skin to skin. Uh, see that? Of course, time is not a criteria. Then we left off the intracranial compound. So that is actually going intracranially here. That component is going intracranially. And uh, now what we will do is we will shave off this component and then come from, because if we remove the intracranial component and the extracranial component, you will have a huge defect and you don't have the tympanic bone. So we had a big problem in a case where we did the, both the components more than two centimeter and finally the patient had a very, very bad CSF, rhino, uh, CSF rotoria and actually we had to do a, uh, Tico peritoneal shine, uh, that was actually a huge problem. So, from then onwards, we never attempt to remove the intracranial component, which is more than two centimeters. Never do that along with the extracranial component. So, this is all the intracranial component going inside the uh, cranial cavity. So, I'm just going to shave that tumor off now. One point the patient and the carrot also had a little spasm, so we tried to pop it. Surface fifty percent, and it actually very got relief with spasm. We see that in the anterior wave as well. So now you can see how beautifully the tumor is being cut off. Right across the pocket. So, so this whole thing is you can see the CSF now. That's a CSF, a little CSF. This is all the intracranial component. You can see the CSF filling up, and this is actually acting as a seal for the CSF. That's very important. This tumor is acting as a seal. So, what will happen is once it fibros, I will close the wound here because this you can see start seeing CSF very clearly. Yeah. That's a complete dissection. I'm just cauterizing it to the level of the dura. That's the level of the dura. Hi, good evening. How are you, my dear friends? So I'm I'm actually cauterizing to the level of the dura. Okay, and then what we do? See that that whole component has. I sealed the, uh, the, the part which is going intracranial. This is very, very important because if you remove that part, then you cannot control the CSFC. So, carotid was actually covered by a flap from the sternocleidomastoid. So, we rotate the sternocleidomastoid over the carotid. So, that's how we cover the carotid. Now, I'm just going to. That. Just go till the level of the dura, cauterize that, and leave it there. And then I will stage the tumor. So what will happen is that I will go again after. So what I will do is I will close it with fat, keep the uh, facial nerve over that, and of course do a blind sac closure. So that that's the end of part one. I, I stage this tumor, and then I go back after again. Uh, uh, three months. So I, I give a gap of around three to six months. And then you see that's part two. I, I do this. Can you see the, the screen now, please? Hello? Yes, we, we can see it, sir. So okay, what I, I usually do... But I will save it to, to the end. There are yeah, what I usually do is I do a retro sigmoid approach. So I don't go through the same wound. Some people go through the same wound, but I what I usually do is to go retro sigmoid and I retract the cerebellum like the conventional neurosurgical procedure and you see what I'm trying to do now. So in this case, the lower cranial nerves were completely, uh, uh, you know, gone. So already palsy of the lower cranial nerves, you can see. Most important thing here is you should be taking care of the uh, pica and the ica. The very, very important arteries which you have to take care of is the pica. And you should be very careful when you dissect it. You see, use a sharp dissection for the arachnoid. And you have the dissector, arachnoid dissector. You see the cranial nerves there. That's towards the jugular foramen. And now I'm trying to create a cleavage. 
from inside the intracranial component of the tumor. See that? So, one thing is, one good thing about our center is that we always work with neurosurgeons, but I've also got trained in, uh, you know, doing intracranial work. So we do it together and we remove the tumor. And you can see that very clearly you're trying to remove the tumor so that you will not have a CSF leak at all. So that's very important. This is a very important carry home message, which I want to say. The same thing, be very careful. Always do it by cautery, cautery, cautery because you don't want blood to collect in the CP angle. That's very important for you. So that's the lower cranial nerves. Of course, we have to sacrifice it because the patient already had a lower cranial nerve palsy. So here we are, I'm now transecting the tumor. So you're gonna see that now, how is that going to be the fee? Now you see I'm using the QSA also in this case. <laughs> The QSA, it is completely avascular. Now you can see that the tumor has completely been removed. You can see that, that's a removal. What we always do is a post-operative uh, uh, MRI. In all cases, we always do a post-operative MRI. I want to show you one very interesting case uh, of uh, 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 temporal jugular paraganglioma, which has already caused a facial palsy. So. The patient presented with a facial palsy, so what do you do? So you, you have a case of a C1. So C1, you know what is a C1? It's actually just uh, adjacent to the uh, carotid. That's actually a, a picture to show you that this, this was the uh, MRI scan. You can see that's the MRI scan. You see the tumor, which is adjacent to the carotid here. Very, very clearly seen tumor, huge tumor, very huge tumor again, completely engulfing the facial nerve as well. So once you do that, you can see that's, that's the embolization. I'm going to skip all this part. And it's the same. We are now trying to do a small flap for the blind sac and then one large flap towards the inferior aspect, towards the sternocular mastoid. And then what we do is that's the blind sac closure. Then what we do is we start drilling. You can see that once we drill, you see that the, the tumor was involving the facial nerve completely. It was engulfing the facial nerve 360 degrees. All the patient had a facial palsy. So what we try to do is to resect or transect the facial nerve along with the tumor. So that's what we do and we will graft the facial nerve. So you will see how we are doing that. Now I'm just going to show you, uh, uh, the, this is just the drilling of the uh, mastoid. You see there is not much bleeding because of the embolization. We generally don't have much bleeding as uh, we would have seen many cases where there's a lot of messy bleeding. This generally doesn't occur at all if the embolization is a good embolization. Of course, you have some complications of the embolization. Some patients, you might have a transient facial paresis. We have seen that in a one or two cases, maybe around two or three cases. Of course, I don't publish my uh, um, year cases because then the people will think that I'm an autologist. So I generally don't publish my uh, year work immediately I'll be branded as an autologist. So I only publish my uh, uh, nose work. So whatever I do on the nose, I pu publish, but I never publish my year work. Though I, I keep doing a lot of year. In fact, our year work is more than our uh, nose work. So that is actually in our center. So you see here, the facial nerve here is the tumor is sitting right over the facial nerve. So it's sitting right over the facial nerve. I'm going to do a retrofacial dissection. The tumor is right there. And now I'm going to show you, and that's a retrofacial dissection. You see the facial nerve. It's almost completely engulfed by the tumor. It's actually, ah, that, that's it. See that? that? That's the stump of the facial nerve. I'm going across the facial nerve now. I'm going across the facial nerve. The tumor is sitting right here over the vertical segment of the facial nerve. Now I'm drilling off the tympanic bone. It's very important. This is very important to expose the carotid artery. Expose the carotid. Expose the carotid by drilling the tympanic bone. Very, 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 very important. Many people, if they compromise on drilling the tympanic bone, then it, it's very difficult. Now again, resection of the tip. See, I'm doing reverse from here, from the mastoid work, then go for the neck work. You can do it either way. It depends on, uh, so the neck dissection part is almost the same. The first structure to identify is the spinal axillary nerve. I will show you how we do that. Of course, it's the same like the previous case. You'll have a lymph node there. Across. You know that along the axillary nerve, you have a group of lymph nodes. You have to dissect that. 
see how I'm doing that. You can see that uh, I will now show you how we are dissecting the neck. It's almost the same like all other cases. So that's actually along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. Remove the fascia, deep cervical fascia, and then you see that beautiful, beautiful. You saw the uh, the spinal axillary. See, this is all like mathematics. This is just glomus is like mathematics. Uh, uh, acoustic neuroma is like mathematics. Everything is like mathematics. So you can see that again. We are trying to take off the lymph node over the uh, spinal axis. You will always find a big chain of lymph nodes. You will have to separate the lymph node and then identify the spinal axillary first. So I'm going to show you that how we do that. I hope you have time, my dear friends. I hope you have time. Yes, we, we have time. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's right. great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now the internal jugular vein, and then I'm now going to show you that's the same neck dissection. That's a uh, uh, neck dissection which I'm doing that then we will always like it, the occipital artery as well. That's the hypoglossal nerve. I'm now trying to trace the uh, uh, carotid artery. You see, I hold the sheath over the carotid. See, I don't hold the carotid, just hold the sheath over the carotid and lift it. So you will beautifully see the bifurcation of the carotid. These are all small tips to uh, actually dissect over the carotid for those juniors who actually, uh, uh, you know, have uh, difficulty in dissection of the carotid. Hold the uh, sheath of the carotid, lift the sheath, and then you can use a bipolar setting at 20 and gently cauterize it and cut it. So it will be almost bloodless. The bloodless dissection of the neck, you will find that, you know, you will not even find RBCs when you dissect. You see that? This is the external and the internal carotid artery very clearly. So that going uh, laterally and superiorly will be the uh, external and this will be the internal carotid. You have clear tapes for both uh, uh, different uh, tapes. You see the ascending pharyngeal very clearly there. That's the ascending pharyngeal artery. And of course, you will ligate the artery separately. You will see that that's the ascending pharyngeal which is ligated. This is the external carotid artery. Uh, of course, you know that the external carotid artery has got branches. The internal carotid artery does not have branches. And now I'm just forwarding this video so that I'm just showing you the occipital artery ligation. This is actually the uh, uh, um, uh, dissection of the... Uh, um, so over the styloid process, of course, uh, I didn't want to show you all that. Just wanted to show you only the facial, facial nerve. So because uh, you're running short of time, I know the time only we have 10 minutes more. I have so many videos to show you. I'm sorry, my dear friend. Yes, uh, uh, we can uh, maybe do some questions. And if you have any other thing to, to show. Yeah, yeah I can show you only this, this case, please. Okay, that's yeah. a cyber yeah. process. I'm just resecting only the, this is the last case. And then we'll go in for questions, please. So I'm dissecting the styloid process, of course. And then we will go in for the dissection of the uh, tumor. That's the internal jugular vein. And then... Be careful about the ninth nerve, the ninth nerve, which is going anteriorly. I'm now trying to take off the tumor, uh, communicating the uh, 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 neck part with the, uh, uh, the uh, oral part by completely resecting the uh, tympanic bone. And once we do that, you can now see that I'm starting to dissect by leaving behind the medial wall of the jugular vein. So that's very important. Leave behind the medial wall of the jugular vein and slowly start dissecting the tumor. And here, the idea was to show how we repair the facial nerve. I'm just taking off. See, that's the medial wall of the jugular vein. You can see that. So the only bleeding point will be the inferior petrosal sinus. You can see that there'll be a little bleeding, but just keep some surgery cell and cauterize over it. It'll stop. So once we resect it, I want to show you how we reanimate the facial nerve. So that's actually the ossicles. This is the tumor. You can see the uh, stapy superstructure. I'm going to show you that we actually resect all that bone. And finally, I'm just going to show you how we're going to reanimate the facial nerve after surgery. Now you have the distal end and the proximal end. I'm just keeping the surgery cell there. That's the, that's the proximal end and you'll find the distal end now. And I'm going to, I usually harvest the sural nerve. So sural nerve is the nerve of choice uh, uh, for our uh, uh, grafting. So I'm going to show you that this is uh, why I showed this video to you. I will show you how we harvest the sural nerve. And uh, you will see that uh, we will now go in for that. The, see that? Now I am dissecting the proximal part of the facial nerve. And then what you do is you make a, a clean cut. You make a clean cut 
with maybe a razor blade or you know a very sharp blade you cut the proximal end that's very very important that you cut it sharp that's very important that you cut it sharp you see that i'm cutting that end sharp very important and then you just get the the distal end that's the distal end again hold it and like that and release it and again cut it sharp with a knife very important that you cut both the ends sharp with a knife and once you do that and then i'm going to show you this just for the sake of juniors who are uh, not very familiar with the harvesting the sural nerve i want to show you how we harvest the sural nerve just have a look at it now just place a little patty and go down to the leg of course this will be the best nerve of choice in fact we do that for acoustics also uh, if you have a long segment now what we are now trying to do is actually try to uh, um, you know put the fat bed everything there before we harvest the nerve so i'm just trying to create a fat bed of course you uh, uh, that's that's the incision that's actually the uh, lateral malleolus and that's between the lateral malleolus and the tendo achilles so you make a uh, incision between the lateral malleolus and the tendo achilles uh, on the leg you see how we're making that incision once you make the incision there you just dissect the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and you will find the sural nerve along with a vessel very very nicely seen you will see that very shortly now and you can see that that will be a vessel which actually is a pointer in fact uh, you will see that now i'm going to dissect the sural nerve yeah so that's it so that's the sural nerve you can see that's the sural nerve and you can get any length of the sural a very 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 long nerve so you what i will do is you see this is where it divides i don't want the division i'll take a incision of the sural nerve here i'll go right proximal and i will now divide the sural nerve and then make the edge very uh, clean cut with a razor knife so i will just make the cut i'm just showing you that's a, uh, that's the sural nerve harvesting and you have a long segment of the sural nerve that's that's sural nerve and what you do is you place facial ara you can see that i'm placing a facial ara there and then you will actually approximate the edges of the sural nerve with the proximal and the distal end of course we can take sutures uh, with 90 that also we have done but in this case uh, what we did is we just approximated and put some fibrin glue you're going to see that what we do for the proximal and the distal segments that's the proximal segment you can see that now we will place the facial nerve there so that's the facial nerve being actually approximated of course you can take a suture definitely we have done that also in a few cases but you know this is uh, done in most of our cases we just approximate and just put that uh, uh, fibrin glue over it and of course you will get a, a grade three a recovery after maybe around six to nine months this is what we have seen uh, not a grade two but a grade three a recovery is what we have achieved by doing this exactly approximate very important to uh, see the fascicles go for a high magnification and try to keep that along the proximal edge see that that that's very important and then once you do that now you see the distal end that's also perfect and then you put some fibrin glue there so this is to reanimate the facial nerve in case you have a palsy of the facial nerve always always try to uh, put in a graft you put in a graft that's very important if you have a uh, sacrifice of the facial nerve uh, it's always better to put in a graft and to me the best graft would be a sural nerve sural nerve graft would be the best so here we are so that is the fibrin glue being applied gently very gently so that it is not being yeah that's a fast glue it's a fast glue and you keep that okay right once we do that we are now putting that fibrin glue right over it and then what i will do is either i will rotate this fascia over it or i'll place another bit of fascia so i'll place another bit of fascia so that you don't have additions between the this tissue and the facial nerve so what i will do now is to place another bit of fascia you see that i'm placing another bit of fascia over the facial nerve so that i don't have any additions uh, of that uh, superficial tissue 
So I will play a strip of fascia and that's the end of the surgery. So I just wanted to show you uh, even a lot more cases. I'm sorry, I, I would like to show you also carotid body tumors, but uh, I think due to lack of time, we can do another uh, lecture if you want. Um, so that's now- That's great, sir. That's great. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, so I want to- some questions. Yeah. I want to discuss a few things with you. Before we go for the questions, I'll discuss a few things okay, with you. Okay, sure, sure, we, we, yeah. So, see, for example, uh, there are some uh, indications. Where, so this is a slow-growing tumor, point number one. There are some indications where you leave behind tumor. That is when it is adherent to the carotids. If the patient doesn't pass a BOT, or if the patient doesn't want any morbidity, mortality, then I have had some cases where I dissected the carotid uh, very beautifully of the tumor, had an infarct somewhere, uh, totally unrelated to, uh, you know, the, uh, because the distribution of the internal carotid artery, you had a small infarct. So some cases do not want any morbidity. And for such cases, what we do, we leave behind a little tumor of the carotid and send the patient for a gamma knife. So these are the patients I send for a gamma knife. So we combine the surgery with a gamma knife for such cases where, where they don't give us consent or if it is over the vertebral artery and it is involving the vertebral artery, then I generally give gamma knife. So these are the indications for uh, gamma knife therapy. But as much as possible, try to remove the tumor to the best of your ability. Because it's a slow growing tumor, don't go in for a morbidity mortality in a case which like this. So this is what uh, I wanted to tell. Now I throw the, uh, uh, the house open for questions. Of course, a lot more to cover. I just covered just a segment of uh, uh, intracranial and also, you know, some involvement of the um, facial nerve and the carotid artery. Yes, over to you now. Uh, Thank you, sir. Those. Yeah. The videos are, are awesome. I, I would like to ask uh, Professor Osvaldo Laesio. Uh, Dr. Laesio is a reference for us here in, in Brazil in, in this topic. And I would like to hear some comments or some questions of him about it. No, sure. I would love to. Oh. I can't see him, actually. Yeah, he's... Hi, I'm here. Osvaldo Cruz. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, congratulations, doctor. You have a Nayana. I Jack can't Kina. still see you. Are Maybe you hearing me? Are you oh, hearing yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Osvaldo Cruz. Yes. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yes, Can yes, you hear me? Of course. Oh, great, very nice. Great, Thank great. you very much. So congratulations, very nice presentation. It was wonderful for all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, just some comments because uh, you do uh, the same way that uh, Mario Sana, that's a good friend of us. Uh, we admire him very well. Um, but we, 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 I have only four questions. First, you show us a very beautiful image on, on CT and uh, on tomography and you didn't show too much image about the reso magnetic resonance. Do you think uh, in any cases you have to, to use the two uh, tools to, to have a, a great opportunity to stage the tumor correctly? Or do you think only CT, uh, the way you show us, can do all the information you need for planning surgery? Yeah. What do you think? Can I answer this question first? And then yes, we'll go to yes. the sure. so, in all cases, in all cases, we do a CD in all the three phases. That is a normal phase, an arterial phase, and a venous phase. Venous phase. This gives us almost all the information. Right. The only indication for me to do a MRI is number one is to see the dural invasion. Number one, you will see the dural invasion. Number two, if it is going to be intracranial, then I want to see the status of the brain, whether the brain is a little edematous, you have a compression of the brain stem, and what, uh, what are the, uh, if you have a heavily titubated image, then you will see the status of the cranial nerves and how, how the arteries inside the, uh, inside the brain, the ICA, the PICA, the, uh, uh, the relationship. If there is an intracranial extension, then I would definitely go. But for all cases, we do an MRI. We do an MRI for all the cases. There is no right. case without an MRI. We always do an MRI. But I will concentrate more if it is going to be a DI, DE or DI uh, one or two. 
So, or a DV, so maybe a vertebral artery or, a, uh, uh, you know, the intracranial component. This is where I will put all my effort to see what is the relationship intracranially. And that is where the MRI is standing out to be the best investigation in a case of a globus. Okay, because we do, uh, as you, uh, the regularly we do both, the, both examination for everybody. Sure. I think it's sure. the best for a stage, but you point a very good uh, thing that uh, magnet resonance is essential for staging tumor intracranially. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good, good tip. Second, uh, I don't know if I well understood, but you do the embolization with gel one. What do you use for embolization? Just gel one? question so see there are multiple um, materials which can be used for embolization uh, we can use gel foam pit you can use PVA particles or we can coil so generally in our center we don't coil we never coil we coil only the internal carotid artery not the external carotid artery so we put permanent coils only for ICA after the BOT after the balloon occlusion test now for the ECA, we use either gel foam or PVA, polyvinyl, uh, that just uh -huh. the PVA or the uh, gel foam. So I think if you're taking the patient immediately after surgery, now for surgery, after maybe 24 to 48 hours, I think gel foam is fine. Maybe I would like to have your comments also on this. Uh, we, we don't use gel foam anymore. We use the... PVA. PVA. And uh, we think it's a little bit more uh, efficient than gel foam. But if you do the surgery 24 hours, at least uh, 48 hours after gel foam embolization, it will be also very good. But if you delay a little bit the surgery, I think the EPA will be more effective. No use, no use. If you delay the surgery, no use. Okay. <laughs> uh, the third point would be the facial transposition. You do uh, on any cases. So we are trying to preserve a little bit. Uh, even for C3 or C4 cases, we try to work uh, anteriorly and posteriorly and anteriorly. It, it, it's sure it, it costs a little more effort and uh, take a little more time. But the functional results on facial, I think it's, it's better. So we don't do the transaction in any case. It's easy uh, to access the, the, the jugular bulb. It will be more easy with the transaction of facial nerve. You have a very large view of the, the jugular the bulb. But I think the functional results uh, are not quite the same. How is your opinion? How is your results on facial nerve when you do the transposition? Very, very, very nice question. Very nice question. I've had a lot of uh, conversation, especially with uh, some very leading neurosurgical experts because we, we have a lot of, I interact more with the neurosurgeons because I'm partly a neurosurgeon. So what happens is they do not do any transposition of the facial nerve. They work anterior, posterior, but the problem is that if you are a very trained uh, skull-based surgeon, then you can do that. You can, uh, you, you can actually manipulate without touching the facial nerve anteriorly and posteriorly. Your results definitely will be better if you don't because you're actually going to retain the uh, petrosal branch of the middle meningeal artery. That is not going to be compromised because it's coming like that from anterior and the blood supply of that part of the facial nerve will go off when you actually transpose the facial nerve from uh, uh, posterior to anterior. So that blood supply, you're going to compromise when you're actually transposing. So you will have definitely a poorer result with transposition. But having said that, if I have a C1, if I have a C1, I try not to transpose it. If I have a C2 or a C3 or a C4, I have to transpose it because I'm playing with the carotid. And when I find that there is a carotid involvement, the carotid carries more importance than the facial nerve for me because i think the dissection of the carotid is a uh, very delicate and gentle you have to do a subadventitial dissection and then i think uh, i may not you know worry too much about this poorer facial nerve uh, results great do you do you, like, do you think that the use of endoscope could help you to dissect the carotid artery uh, 
immediately uh, and uh, on the horizontal part? Do you use a complementary to the microscope, the endoscope? You, you're actually causing a, a lot of uh, uh, problem between the endoscope. If you, the, it is not the instrument. It is the person behind the instrument which matters. Mm -hmm. You can use any instrument. But I think it is the person who is handling the endoscope. To me, I, am, I cannot do it with an endoscope. I need okay. both my hands. And in fact, even when I do a, a retro sigmoid approach, sometimes I use the endoscopic. Nowadays, I do trigeminal uh, neuralgia as endoscopic. But there is one Dr. Shilpi Bhatia Sharma. She's also in this group. She's watching us. She is my pair. She holds the endoscope. I use both the hands. Great. So I, I don't want to compromise my left hand. My, my left hand is very important for me to di dissect. It's the two hand, the feel is beautiful. Why should I lose my one hand? <laughs> oh, great. I, I agree. Uh, the final question is, uh, we, we try to do, uh, we don't stage surgery when we have a TE uh, tumors because we work with the neurosurgeon and uh, we close the cavity to avoid the fistula the same way we do for translab approach for acoustic schivanoma and only in few cases of three uh, eye uh, more than two centimeters we, 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 we stage surgery but you show very good results staging surgery so we are poor in Brazil so do great surgery costs a lot of money so we try to do it in one in one surgery you know <laughs> no that's not true you're humble but you are actually uh, the best i know i've read your uh, papers very very good uh, in fact i'm talking with one of the best professors in the world i know that but the thing is that i, I let me tell you that i don't publish my results in notology the reason is because I do not want to be branded as an otologist. And I was talking to Dr. Nivel No, and I told him, please don't ask me to post my uh, 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 temporal jibular paracanular because then from tomorrow, people will say I'm otologist. I'm not otologist, I'm rhinologist. So this is the problem. So come answering your question, answering your question. Acoustic neuroma, we do regularly in our center. We, we do a lot of acoustics. I do the acoustics intracranial part also I do uh, uh, inside so I can I can do it completely intracranial. Now there is a difference between acoustic tumors and glomus. What is the difference? In acoustic you don't remove the tympanic bone. So the tympanic bone acts as a very big bridge to prevent a CSF leak. Now if you this is just for the juniors. If you remove the tympanic bone there is no bridging for the CSF. The CSF will just flow without a dam effect. It will just flow down. If you can close the defect from inside with a... Uh, uh, so you, you're going to use a retro sigmoid approach in the same setting or whatever. What we found in one case was I did uh, through the same approach, I removed the tumor and we had a massive problem of a persistent CSF autoria leak here. And so we had to do diversion. We had to do CSF of diversion. So we learned that we should not do it. So if I have a DI1, then I do it same sitting. If I have DI2 or DI3, I stage my tumor. So this is the only difference. In DI1, I just remove it with the same sitting. But DI2, DI3, then I, I just completely stage it. But I appreciate if you can come away, we can do away with the CSF part, CSF leak part uh, uh, by doing some kind of closure. It's very good. It's very good. You're saving the cost. You're saving another anesthesia. Well, for a rhinologist, you are an awesome otologist. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Let's listen to Ronaldo comments now. Yeah, yeah please. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing well. Yeah. Okay, thank you for having me here. The invitation. So nice to meet you, Doctor. Hi, Doctor. How are you? I, I'm good, thanks. So I, I, uh, it's nice. First, I, I'd like to congratulate you for, because you do both nas nasal disease and ear disease, and also some intracranial work. Uh, so it's it's very. Uh, 
Freddy, thanks for that. Because you have some things about you, know, you can't do nasal and ear the same way. So I do the same. It, it's nice here you do also. So at, I, I really like to thank you for the presentation, for the case, it's very, some challenging case you show us about working in ICA. So yeah, yeah, everyone who works in this talk knows how difficult you manage of internal carotid artery in this artery special, uh, petros carotid artery in the horizontal part. So, uh, 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 we do all, almost the same you about the technique. Of course, some small difference, but uh, it's actually in the final result that I think is the same. For instance, uh, you um, more recently you avoid your trans facial transposition, so you prefer use a follow-up bridge technique because there's some concept about that. So uh, first, I have to say some things. Uh, I think paraganglioma tumors we change a lot how to deal or treat this tumor for the last 15 years when I start performing the surgery. That time we we're more aggressive and try to remove everything, including internal carotid, like you show us. And I had some cases in the past with have a good uh, uh, polygon of Williams and you have occluded the internal carotid, occluded also vertebral artery. So, but nowadays you switch, you don't do this anymore because some new players in this disease treatment now, as the whole of the radiotherapy. So 15 years ago, we never used that, but now we start using much more often. And another play, it's about genetic tests, special when you search SHD, you can find the tumors more aggressive, especially the risk of mal malignization of this tumor. So now when you face a patient, we will have to check every, every thing about genetic tests, the tumor, the symptoms, and especially in Brazil, uh, patients don't like, uh, don't deal very well if some facial pulse or also uh, some 9, 11, 10, 11 nerves. So for, for instance, for case you have a small tumor, no symptoms. It, even young patients, you try to observe much more nowadays than the past. For elderly people, um, even they have some symptomatic tumors, you try to preserve much possible the nerve function, so you remove partial of the tumor and add radiotherapy and, uh, after the, the surgery. So I, we don't have a special guideline for every patient so you have to deal individually and for that uh, all case i had transposition of the facial nerve the results of function was at least the best way is grade three yes most of, the, most of the cases grade four or five so i know the transposition of the facial nerve it's necessary to work internal carotid. I, I think the only, only, only reason to transposition is internal carotid work because the for them, jugular for them, you can work very well with the facial in left, the, its position. So especially internal carotid C2 or C3, sometimes uh, you, you keep some tumor behind around the, the carotid art. And I prefer keep the function, facial function there. And because you can observe the station F and if the tumor start growing, you can rate, give some radiotherapy or, or, or something like that. Um, my question, uh, I don't have this yeah, I, I question, to comment, of course. I want to comment Dr. Uh, Professor Ronaldo. Uh, I want to comment on this. The whole concept, just for the sake of juniors, I want to tell you that the whole concept of skull base and neurosurgery is shifting from, a, it's a paradigm shift from total removal to functional preservation. 
So whether you do a craniopharyngioma, you do a pituitary, you do whatever you want, uh, you do an acoustic, you do whatever. But now the whole there is a whole paradigm shift from complete removal to a near total or a subtotal removal with preservation of function. And now is the era of functional neurosurgery. And so we have to preserve. And I fully agree with Professor Ronaldo when he says that I would like to leave behind tumor if there is function. And the, my point was very clear. I said, if it's going to be a C2, C3, or a C4, only then will I do a facial transposition. Or else I will try to manage it with an intact facial nerve. So that's, that's important. Now, yeah. all your oh, oh, questions, please. Your question, please. Yeah. No, my question is about one, uh, uh, some recurrence of tumor. When, when you have some case like recurrence and uh, how do you deal with it? Do you observe, do you give some radiotherapy? What things is important you consider treat of recurrence to them? For instance, the age of the patient, uh, if it have some genetic mutation, the risk of the malignization is higher. So how do you deal? Because it's, it's difficult usually how to deal with recurrence to them because the, the patient sometimes the, the surgery was very aggressive and they spend a lot of time to recover and you say, oh, surgery again. So, uh, so this, uh, I'd like to know, you, how do you deal with recurrence tumor? And uh, uh, do you have- I will answer have... the next question. I will answer the, can I answer your okay. question? Thank you. Yes. Number one. So before I address your question, I would want to put one important uh, statement. Many people who do skull-based surgery have the mentality, at least I have seen this, that's why I'm telling this, not to take a post-operative MRI or a CD scan. So they send the patient back home without doing an MRI or a CECD, whatever modality, and they say that you come back after six months, maybe lost to follow up. So I always say, whether it's JNA, pituitary, craniopharyngioma, any, any tumor, acosinoma, you should be uh, humble enough to accept your own residuals. So this is point number one. You always tell the patient that, yes, I left behind a residual by taking a post-operative uh, MRI. This is a very, very important part of protocol. This, uh, honestly, in, uh, at least in otolaryngology, uh, we generally tend to skip this as such. We don't generally tell the patient, okay, you have a recurrence uh, or you have a, a residue. The recurrent tumor, I always say, is a tumor where you've already done a post-operative MRI, which does not show a residual tumor. This is very important. And then you classify it as a recurrent tumor. So the patient comes to you after one year or two years. Maybe there's a microscopic residue which is not picked up by a CT scan or MRI. Then you call it a recurrent tumor. So there's a difference between, a or else I always say all tumors are residual tumors, not recurrent tumors. They're all residual tumors. You leave behind because the first thing I ask, have you got a post-operative MRI? If the patient says no, then I always say this is a residual tumor, not recurrent tumor. Point number one. Very, very important point. Point number two to answer your question. If the patient has been operated, the post-operative MRI is normal. Patient comes back to us after one year saying that, yes, I have a recurrent tumor. This is a definition of a recurrent tumor. Well, the, there are multiple factors which I will take into consideration. Point number one is the age, the age of the patient. We have had patients above 60 and below 60. We have young patients, we have old patients. So always for all, this is, please understand, it's a very slow growing tumor. It's not, a, it's not like a malignancy going very fast. So it's a slow growing tumor. So there is a very important protocol of observation. Just observe, just observe. That's a very important point. Number two, the patient is a young patient. The patient is having an aggressive tumor. The patient is having an aggressive tumor, very rapid growth. Uh, maybe you do a three months 
uh, interval MRI, you have a very aggressive uh, tumor, facial palsy, the 1911 palsy, then I would immediately intervene. So you have many options to intervene. Number one, I always prefer to give a gamma knife therapy. I will give a trial of a gamma knife. So this is what I will do uh, uh, in most of my patients. And I will observe again after the gamma knife. If it doesn't respond, then I would plan for a research. This is what I, I believe. But if it is done by me, then I know what I have done. I write my notes. I, I left behind a little tumor on the carotid artery. I, I know it's a residual. But if the patient has been operated outside, then I will know that this is a residual or maybe a good surgeon. Maybe that's a good surgeon. He's operated, there's a residual tumor. Then I would again consider his age, his uh, uh, rapidity of growth, uh, uh, the aggressiveness of the tumor, uh, the, uh, the uh, cranial nerves, how I can preserve the function of the cranial nerves. And then only the last option is a resurgery. I will not go and operate immediately. I will not jump on a, uh, uh, to operate on a surgery. Did I answer your question, please? Yes, yes. It's, yeah. Uh, I, I agree, especially about the, the concept of residual and recurrence tumor. I think all cases are residual. Yes. Probably uh, just some microscope disease you left behind and uh, it takes sometimes two or three years to appear on MRI. So it's, it's perfect. Uh, I, I, I like to make some comments about how to you close the sigmoid signs. Uh, I noticed about this technique Dr. Senna used that's just blocked with a piece, a big piece of surgery cell. And uh, I'm really worried about this bleeding in post-operative time because surgery cell it's have some time it's absorbed. And so I, I prefer to interdural dissection. It's I know it's pretty it's not easy, it's sometimes pretty hard. Uh, you have to keep the 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 wall of this uh, sigmoid signs intact and also the the dura of posterior fossa and but I I prefer to do this 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 technique. So I have to remove the, post, the bone of posterior part of the signal sign very well. You have a, a wide exposition and do very careful. And, 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 and so I block, I, I use this for cut and, and suture the, the signal signs. And no, so you, I, but the only problem in the technique is that you have to expose of the post, post sigmoid and the pre sigmoid dura very clearly, completely, and that yeah. involves more bone removal. Exactly. So that's the only thing. Yeah. It's take, it's perfect, take, perfect. It's take at least 30 minutes more. And you, uh, I, I didn't see in your presentation about how to block the inferior petrosal sinus. So uh, just I pay how. So first thing, I, I, I block the sigmoid signs and keep the jugular vein intact to because I know the inferior petrol sign, the drainage is still working in this time. So I just uh, cut the inferior, uh, the jugular, internal jugular vein after everything is clean. And after I remove the anterior part of the sigmoid signs, I, in the past, I used surgery cell to block the inferior petrol sign. But nowadays I change. So I use foam. I think it's much easier and much faster you, you close the openings of inferior petrol signs. Uh, because Geoffrey, it, sometimes it's massive, you have some dip. So I, I use this. I don't know if, because I didn't see in your presentation how do you. Yeah, I'm do sorry. This I, very important step very of important. the surgeon to have some bleeding. It's the only time you have some bleeding. Yes. Perfect, perfect. Uh, uh, hitting the nail on its head. The only part you will have bleeding when you embolize it will be the inferior petrosal sites. Very important. And when you mess around the inferior petrosal sinus, you should understand that the cranial nerves are very close to the inferior petrosal sinus. So if you try to press or give a lot of pressure on that and you try to, you know, cauterize over the surgery cell, there's every chance that you will uh, cauterize and you will transmit the heat on the lower cranial nerves. So that's why, Professor, I'm sorry, I, I have edited that part. Maybe I can actually show it to you uh, if you want how I do that. What we do is we now use a surgery cell 
nice surgery cell uh, over it, but we don't compress it too much. We just wait. We just wait. We have fibrillar surgery cell, fibrillar, fibrillar surgery cell. And that we nicely make it like a ball and we plug it nicely. If you have it, you can show it if you want, sir. Uh, I will show that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think fibrillar surgery cell is much easier than normal surgery cell, but uh, because using the, op the openings, the openings of inferior petrol sign is very small, and sometimes it's not easy to block. So I prefer nowadays I use for I I don't know if you have opportunity to use for like you use in in pituitary or cardiac yeah, signs. Yeah, 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 of course, of it's course. The only works, problem it works uh, perfectly. Uh, see, I'm not able to see you. The problem is wait, 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 wait. wait. No, I, I'm I'm not able to uh, uh, find out that video. I have a lot. I will just try to post that video onto you. But you see, you have Duraform. Duraform is a wonderful, wonderful uh, piece where we use that duraform in uh, closure of the dura. It, it is used to close the dura. We use, I think we have showed several videos where we close that. Uh, I think there are some videos on the YouTube also, which I posted. You close the dural defect with this uh, duraform. But as professor says, it's a brilliant idea. I have never tried it. I will try it in my next case. I will okay. try it in my next case. Very good point, very good point. Thank you. Great, yeah. Many questions were already answered uh, by this discussion. Any anybody that has any question may may say it. I want to thank again uh, Professor Oswaldo Laesio. He is actually now going to his clinics, and also Dr. Ronaldo. Both thank are you. professors here in, in in Brazil, reference for us. And also, of course, Dr. Janakiran for the beautiful case, beautiful videos. We hope to see you in other. Uh, 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 presentations together. We can actually do a lot of. Uh, uh, see, if you are interested, we have a, a, a complete series on carotid body tumors. Uh, uh, Shamblin one, Shamblin two, Shamblin three. All the kinds of carotid body tumors which we have operated, we have complete documentation. We can have one lecture series. Another, you have Mira, minimally invasive retrocyte part approach for uh, the uh, uh, facial um, uh, hemifacial spasm, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, you have small acoustic tumors, so you can have that as a class. You have acoustic tumors, all the various kinds of acoustic tumors we can have. As a, so you have so many uh, um, um, sessions you can have. Just contact me. I'm ready uh, to be there with you uh, uh, anytime. That's an honor, sir. That's an honor. Thank you very much. On the, in the name of Dr. Nuvan Andrade, also is uh, our chief. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Master, uh, I think you have to schedule the, the next uh, uh, pituitary. Yeah, lunch. sure. That's okay. We schedule to you, and I think uh, uh, again uh, uh, the masters uh, Ronaldo and Oswaldo Laesio, and uh, I think now we have to <laughs> to close the Zoom. To go to lunch but, here. Uh, very <laughs> nice video conference again. <laughs> Uh, we'll okay. send to you something about the next uh, the yeah. very lesson. So yeah, you, can, you have to choose. No. You have to choose. You can do anything on the skull bed. You can do a draft three. You can have a, you know a CSF. League. I'm writing a next book on CSF leak. So we can have CSF leaks. We can have you whatever you name the topic. You can have even basic mastoid surgery. So Dr. we do. Uh, do uh, there's another final question. question. Mastoids. Uh, from, yeah, a, a yeah. final question from Brazil from uh, Professor Marcos Antunes from yeah. Sao Paulo. Yeah. He's asking about genetic is examinations and it's genetic exams in younger patients. If you do some of these genetic tests, yeah, fine. That is that's a very valid point. Basically, we don't do a genetic uh, testing even for JNAs or glomas or we don't do the genetic testing. And of course, uh, we don't have that. Uh, facility. I am living in a small village. Please understand, this is a very small village in India, and we have the maximum of an interventional radiologist. That's it. Great we don't day. have any. Yeah. yeah. So we don't. We. we I am not in a capital city of uh, uh, Madras or Calcutta. I'm uh, in a very small village. I'm. I'm doing my work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. See you.
Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with all my brothers from Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye That's bye. awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.